Hello, welcome back. In today's lecture, we're going to try to formally define the relationship between risk and return. Uh, what do I mean by formally? We have already looked at the historic data and we saw that there is indeed a trade-off between risk and return. With higher risk, we will demand a higher return. What we try to do when we try to develop uh, to express this relationship formally is to come up with an equation. And the theory that allows us to reach that point is called the modern portfolio theory and the resulting equation is derived through the capital asset pricing model. These are the two most important modern finance theory and is the founding principles of um, our current understanding thing of finance, especially in asset pricing. Asset pricing means understanding the relationship between risk and return in equity, in stocks, uh, and in bonds. So first, we're going to uh, further explore the concept of return, um, particularly expected versus unexpected return. So for, uh, in our example, we have seen that the average return or the expected return are typically very different from the realized return. So um, remember that expectation is from ahead of time. So we may have high expectation, but what actually happened uh, may be different from our, from our expectation. What actually happened typically has two components. One of them is expected and the other is unexpected. And um, this may seem obvious, but let me uh, bear with me and I'll exp take another minute to, to develop the model formally. So the expected component is typically well understood and it may evolve or change over time, but bef uh, at any given point in time, investors have a pretty good idea of what their expectation is. The unexpected component, on the other hand, can be either positive or negative. Um, over time, the, ex the average of the unexpected, unexpected component should equal to zero. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video and think a little bit and ask yourself why. OK, so let's see, check your understanding. The analogy that I like to use for expected versus unexpected return is um, com your commuting time to, to work, for example. You have an expected time to go to work, for example. Typically, it takes you around 20 minutes to go from your house to your work. On any particular day, it is seldom exactly 20 minutes. Some days it may be 18 minutes, some days maybe 90 minutes, some days it may be 22 minutes. There are very, very few days that you will literally arrive at your workplace on the dot at 20 minutes. So that's what we meant by the expected return uh, and your realized return are typically not the same. So your realized return is the actual time that it took you to go to work. The expected return is the time that you, you think You'll, you'll be able to get to work. So if you are a rational person, um, you will time your commute such that you know that on average, it'll take you 20 minutes, even though you know that some days it may take a few minutes longer, some days it will take a few minutes later. However, if you find yourself in a situation where day after day after day is taking you 25, 26, 27, or 24 minutes, meaning that you never were able to get to work in less than 20 minutes, a rational person will then change their expectation. So they'll update the expectation. They'll update the expectation such that on average, the unexpected component is zero. So what that means is, if it's taking you longer, you update your expectation. You, you, now your expected time is 25 minutes. And you may someday arrive after 27 minutes. Someday you may arrive after 24 minutes. But on average, now you get there within 25 minutes. So a rational investor will do the same thing. They will update the expected return until the average unexpected return is zero. So the, the reason why the unexpected component will average out to zero is because investors will continue to update the expectation given new information. Next, let's take a look at risk. 
Particularly, we want to look at risk and diversification. So we already talked about the, the general concept a little bit that if we diversify, meaning not putting all our eggs in one basket, we by, might be able to spread our risk and lower our risk. But before we can do that formally, we need to have a clear definition of what kind of risk are we talking about. So total risk is often measured as the standard deviation of an investment. And we'll talk a little bit about investment versus wealth. So one of the things that we want to focus on is the total wealth of an investor. So an investor is concerned with the risk, the total risk of her entire wealth. And this is where diversification may come into play. If an investor holds a single stock, meaning she put all her eggs into one basket, then the total risk of her wealth will be the same as the total risk of that particular stock. However, if the investor holds more than one stock, let's say she holds two stocks, then the total risk of her wealth, and we call that a portfolio, a portfolio is simply a collection of more than one asset. So it can be one stock, one bond, or two stocks. So anytime we put our money into more than one single investment, we have a portfolio. When that happens, the risk of that portfolio depends on how the unexpected events of one stock may or may not offset the unexpected event of the other stock. So it becomes a little bit more complicated. We're going to go through some examples to demonstrate that. To help us understand the formal relationship between risk and return, particularly total risk and diversification, we're going to use some numerical examples. And to do that, we are going to use sample statistics. Now, in the last, mod in the last uh, module, we have talked about how to compute historic average return, historic average, and also uh, historic sample variance and historic standard deviation. If you expect that the past is going to be exactly the same as the future, you can use the historic arithmetic average as your expected return. You can use the historic variance as your future variance and the, expect and the historic standard deviation as your future standard deviation. That is probably true the majority of the time. However, on, in, in special situation, um, you may have more insight, you may have more information, and you may want to update your expectations. So we talk about uh, using historic averages as an estimation, but then if you have new information, you want to update that. If you want to update that, we can, we, um, we're going to introduce another way to compute expectation and variance and standard deviation that allow you to incorporate that new information. First, let's take a look at expected return. As we said earlier, if you are using historic return, if you don't have any additional new information, you can use the historic arithmetic average as our expected return. So that's one option. However, if we do have additional information and we want to capture that, we can compute it using a probability function. So in here, um, we list out all the possible outcomes. So S here stands for a possible scenario, a possible outcome. And there are N possible outcomes. So N can be three. The economy can go, can stay the same, can do better than current, can do worse than current. So that will give you a three scenario. And each scenario, we assign it a probability. And then we estimate what the return will be under that scenario. So S is the possible state or possible scenario. P is the probability that particular scenario will happen. And R is the return on the stock. And here we call it the asset. An asset is just any investment. An asset A, when that particular state occur. Let's take a look at an example that may help us uh, better understand what we were referring to in that particular equation. So we talk about possible state or possible outcome. So we have two states. One is that the economy will enter a boom, or the other is the economy will enter a bust. So, those, so we have two. So this is state one, and this is state two. 
And next we talk about probabilities. So here we have our probabilities. So there's a 40% chance that the economy will be in a boom. So 40% chance that day one will occur. And lastly is the return on stock A when that happens. So there's a 40% chance the economy is going to enter a boom and stock A will generate a 30% return. And we also have a second state, this economy can go into a bust. In fact, there's a 60% chance that the economy will enter a bust. And when that happens, stock A is going to actually generate a negative or lose 10% in return. So now this will make, more, hopefully this makes more sense. Next, I'm going to explain this symbol. This symbol is sometimes referred to as sigma. Sigma seems, simply means that it's a sum, meaning you're adding up all these components. So in our particular example, we have only two states. Remember that um, we only have two states, which is boom or bust. So if I were going to write this out for our example, what that means is I take the probability of state 1 occurring times the return on stock A when state 1 occurs, meaning when there's a boom, plus the probability of state 2 occurring, meaning a bust, and the return on stock A when that happens. So remember that 1 is a boom and two is a bust in our example and that's what this symbol represents this symbol is summation so we can rewrite this out um, if there are more than two states we just simply add more to it so in the in the example you just saw we only have two so let's apply this equation to the example we just saw and compute the expected return so remember that the expected return is the sum. So the expected return for stock A in here is the probability. So probability is 40% that the first day will occur. So there's a 40% chance that stock A will return a 30% because the economy will be in a boom. Plus, there's a second probability, which is 60%. There's a 60% chance that stock, the economy will be in a bust, and stock A is going to lose 10%. When we work this out, we find that our expected return on stock A is 6%. So given the, given the possible future outcome and our belief in the probability of, how, of the chances of each outcome occurring, we believe that this, uh, the expected return for stock A is 6%. Again, I want to emphasize that the expected return is very different from the realized return. This is an extremely simplified uh, example where we call it, this is a discrete, dis, uh, discrete probability, meaning that there's only two outcomes. So your realized return is going to be either 30% or you're going to lose 10%. You'll actually never earn 6%. There's no scenario under which you'll get 6%. That's just your expectation. So it's very important to understand the difference between expected return and realize return. Now that you know how to compute expected return, the next thing we're going to do is to compute variance, again, and standard deviation. Again, we're going to use probability rather than historic. So if you, if if the past is very likely going to repeat in the future or that you don't have a whole lot of information about the future, the best strategy is to use historic variance and historic standard deviation. However, if you do have additional information, we want to capture that. So the first, th remember that this is uh, the variance. So sigma square is variance. So to compute the variance is very similar. We want to compute the deviation. We want to square the deviation. But instead of dividing by the number of observations, we are multiplying it by the probability. So if you think about it, if the, if it, in fact, one of the ways that we can understand historic variance or arithmetic average is that we assume that every single past event has an equal probability of occurring. And that's why we add up the past outcome and divide by the number of observations. What we are doing here using uh, this probability function is that we allow probability for different events to have different weight, meaning that some some outcome may be more likely than others. 
Once we have multiplied the probability by the deviation, we then add up the total. So again, this is a summation. For our example, where there were two states, I can again write this out. So we have the probability that there's a boom. So remember, one is the economy will be a boom. We take the probability of that times the return on stock A when there is a boom minus the expected return on stock A, which we have computed. And we square that. And we add to it, remember, sum means addition. Probability of event two, again, event two is a bust, times the return on stock A if event two occurs, minus the expected return on stock A, and then again we square the deviation. So writing out the variance in long form when there are two states will look like this. If there are more than two, we just keep adding to the terms. So th in this way, when we use the summation sign, this is a more general way to say we'll just add up all these products. Now let's take a look at our example and work out the numbers. Now remember we already computed the expected return by stock A, and that is 6%. So next, we're going to compute the variance, the variance for stock A. Remember that variance is oftentimes denoted by sigma square. So the first thing we're going to do is take the first probability. So we have a 40% chance. 40% chance of what happening? 40% chance of getting 30%, whereas we were expecting only 6%. So we subtract the expected return, and we will square the difference. Plus, in the second scenario, in the second scenario, we have a 60% chance of losing 10%. So our return is minus 10% when we're expecting 6%. Again, we will square that deviation. Um, so I want to pause the video, make sure you understand this, and also continue and get the right answer. Welcome back. Did you get the variance to be upon? 384.0384. If you do, congratulations. If not, I want you to continue, uh, to go back and check your work, particularly this part, because minus 10%, minus 6%, uh, altogether you have minus 16%, and then you need to square that. Once you have computed the variance, the last step is to compute the standard deviation. Fortunately, st computing standard deviation is the same regardless of what, how you compute the variance. The standard deviation is always the square root of the variance. So uh, standard deviation of sigma is equal to the square root of 0 0.0384, which turns out to be 0 0.1959, or 19.59%. Notice that I can convert the expected return and the standard deviation into percentages, but I cannot convert the variance into a percentage. The variance have to stay as a decimal. So this is very similar to when we use the historic return. So to summarize, if we do not know any additional information, meaning no probability available, then we will simply use the historic arithmetic average as the expected return, and we will use the historic sample standard deviation for the future standard deviation. And those are uh, we went over how to compute the historic arithmetic average and historic variance and historic standard deviation in the last module. Okay. We'll stop here. Uh, in the next module, we'll continue the discussion about how we can use uh, the, the expected return and standard deviation to help us understand, further understand the relationship between risk and return.